Hello again, Jeremy Howard here with Orchard Hills Bible Church, wanting to invite you to look at the Bible with me as you are reading through the Bible, the Old Testament in particular, this year for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Come Follow Me curriculum. I want to make a couple comments here at the start. This is the third video that's come out, and since the first one has come out, the, the second one, at the time I'm recording this, the second lesson has not yet been published, but the first one has, and I've gotten a ton of feedback, and uh, just want to make a couple of notes based on some things that I've heard. Number one, I am not a Hebrew expert. I mentioned that in passing in the first uh, episode, the first video, but apparently it wasn't clear enough. I'm not a Hebrew expert. Uh, the Hebrew language is not my expertise. I just know a little bit enough to just kind of sound dangerous in some settings. I made a blunder in the first episode with something I mentioned about the Hebrew language, which I was kept called out on in a very ungracious way by a Mormon apologist, and that's okay. Uh, the blunder deserved to be called out. So anyway, just want to let you know I know a lot more about Greek than I do about Hebrew. I have never been professionally trained in Hebrew at all. Uh, Greek, I did take several hours of Greek in uh, Bible college, but not Hebrew. The other thing I want to mention is that a couple of people have said I've sounded condescending. Don't know what to do about that. I'm doing my best just to be conversational. So if you think I'm sounding condescending, sorry, I, I can't help the way that I sound, but that is not my intention. So not unlike uh, Enoch in Moses 6 that we'll look at here in a little bit. All the people took offense at him, it says. Well, if you're taking offense at me, it's not my intention for that to happen. I'm actually trying to be the exact opposite of that so that you'll actually hear me out. So uh, anyway, just want to make those notes here at the start. Well, uh, this week your lesson is Genesis 5 and Moses 6. And uh, I was confused as to why Genesis 5 would have its uh, a whole week for that chapter when chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis were put together for one week and chapters 3 and 4 of Genesis were put together for one week. Uh, it seems strange that Genesis 5 got a week all to itself because it is much less exciting at first glance uh, than the first four chapters of Genesis. Then I read Moses 6 and realized, oh, well, there's a lot going on in Moses 6, which makes sense as to why that would need its full week. But before we get to Moses 6, let me go ahead and let's switch to this view here and look at Genesis chapter 5. So the first thing I want to mention as we begin looking at the text of the Bible here is just a refresh from the first video when I talked about the importance of Genesis 5.3, where it says that the son of Adam, Seth, was born according to Adam's image, and he was in Adam's own likeness. Now, if you didn't hear the first lesson, I suggest you go back and check that out. There's an important reason why that's listed. It's telling the reader that Seth inherited this immaterial aspect of Adam's humanity. It was passed on, and that included both the image of God and the sin nature. Uh, that's being communicated that Seth now has inherited what Adam earned. Okay, or what Adam was given in the case of the image of God. So it's important just to recognize that. But as we continue on in the chapter 5 of Genesis here, we see that just kind of in passing, it says that uh, there were other sons and daughters uh, that were born to Adam and Eve. And this makes sense, of course, because all we've heard up to this point is Cain and Abel and Seth. Well, to populate the world, you've got to have some females. And so there were other sons and daughters. And this answers the question, where did Cain get his wife, right? It's a, it's a popular retort to people who believe the Genesis account of creation. Well, where did Cain get his wife? There's really only one option, it, his own family, right? It could have been his sister. It could have been uh, one of his nieces or a great niece or something like that. But, uh, Really, those are the only options. These are the only people alive on the earth. God started not with two couples or three couples. He started with one couple, Adam and Eve. And so Cain had to get his wife from his own family. Uh, there, of course, are immediate reactions to that, like, 
whoa, what do you mean? Uh, I mean, isn't that wrong for a man to take his own sister as his wife? And of course, the answer is yes, uh, that is wrong. In fact, uh, you could go to the law and you can read that it's wrong for someone to be with sexually a close relative. It's spelled out in the law. So it's a sin to do that. Yet this is before the law. This is before there were more and more people on the earth. Uh, Of necessity, then, this is how the earth was to be populated. Uh, You might also react with, well, what about the physical, genetic type issues that come from incest? Because those are obviously very real effects. We know in this day and age that when a man has a, a reproductive relationship with a close relative that that will have some effects, uh, some physical effects and genetic effects. Well, we can explain that by considering the state that man was in at that time. Man's genetic defects were extremely limited compared to all of the genetic defects that exist today. When a, a couple of close relatives reproduce, they likely share some of the same genetic defects inherited from the same parents or the same uh, family. And so when those two people seek to reproduce, their offspring are going to reflect the, com- the, the uh, mashing up of the same genetic defects and compound the issue, amplify the issue. It'll be seen physically in the offspring. Whereas at this time, we're talking now just the second and third generations of people who have lived, Adam, and then Seth and Cain, and their children, human beings had a much purer purer genetic code at this time. And you can see this in how long people lived. As you read through, let's go back to the, uh, the text here in Accordance, the Bible software. In Genesis chapter 5, you'll see um, Adam lived 930 years. Okay, that's a, that's a long time. Seth lived 105 years before he became a dad, which is pretty incredible. He lived 807 years after he became a dad. And so the total days of Seth, down here in Genesis 5-8, the total days of Seth were 912 years. And so this is showing us that, of course, human beings were in a different physical condition at that time. And genetically, there there weren't the defects that we deal with today, certainly not at the... uh, the, the quantity of defects that we have today. Well, as you go through the text of Genesis 5, you see Enosh being mentioned here, the son of Seth, and you continue down and you can see different people's names and uh, different lengths of time that they lived. Again, they lived a very long time. Methuselah famously lived the longest, 969 years, which is pretty uh, amazing. You see that there in verse 27. All the days of Methuselah were 969 years. Wow. I don't think I want to live that long. Um, and you have uh, just the the line of Adam spelled out here all the way up to Noah. That's where the chapter ends is with Noah. But in all of this, you've got Enoch. Enoch, and I mentioned him at the beginning because I found out that Moses chapter 6 spends a lot of time talking about Enoch. Well, as the Bible is concerned, Enoch is pretty mysterious. He walked with God 300 years uh, after he became the father of Methuselah. All the days of of Enoch were 365 years. And then you get this amazing verse, Genesis 5, 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He was just living for the Lord, and then poof gone. He didn't die like normal people die. Everyone else dies. He walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, there's a lot of mystery about this and about the life of Enoch. You get to the New Testament, and in the book of Jude, the book of Enoch is referenced, which is a very mysterious thing. Lots of people throughout history have tried to extrapolate some information about the life of Enoch, And there's just not much to go on, but you see this in Moses 6, where um, we'll flip on over here. We'll see this here that uh, there's a lot of attention put on Enoch, okay? And 
I thought there was some interesting stuff in there because uh, there's not much talking about Genesis 5. I don't know if there's anything talking about Genesis 5 on the actual churchofjesuschrist.org page. It's all Moses 6. Moses 6. Well, I really messed things up here. Um, it's all referencing Moses 6. So let's actually take a gander at Moses chapter 6. There are a couple of things I want to look at. This is really interesting. It says that a book of remembrance was kept in which the, in which, in the which, that's an interesting way of phrasing things. A book of remembrance was kept in the which was recorded in the language of Adam, for it was given unto as many as called upon God to write by the spirit of inspiration. And by them, their children were taught to read and write, having a language which was pure and undefiled. Now this same priesthood, which was in the beginning, shall be in the end of the world also. Now this prophecy Adam spake as he was moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and a genealogy was kept of the children of God, and this was the book of generations of Adam, saying, In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God he made him, in the image of his own body, male and female, created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created and became living souls in the land upon the footstool of God. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his own image and called his name Seth. Okay, well, uh, this is interesting to me. I will not make a habit of commenting on the standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm a Bible guy, not um, a guy who can comment with any real great comprehensive authority on on this. I have studied a lot of, um, for lack of a better word, Mormonism and Mormon theology, but uh, I'm not going to make a habit of going to the Book of Moses or book of Abraham in talking this way. But I think for this lesson, it's appropriate. We see uh, lots of interesting stuff going on here that is not in the Bible, talking about the language, the language being pure and undefiled, children being able to read and write. We see a mention of the priesthood. That's not in the Bible. Um, We see that Adam was moved by the Holy Ghost to speak prophecy. That's not in the Bible. And We see here this very interesting phrase, that God created Adam and Eve, because it says male and female, in the image of his own body. Now, going back to that first lesson, um, again, if you haven't watched it, you should go back and check that out. But in the first lesson, we were reading from, uh, I think we were referencing the book of Moses, chapter 2, perhaps. And it says that Adam and Eve were made in the image of his own only begotten. And it doesn't say physical body, I don't think, in that passage. And yet here in Moses chapter 6, verse 9, it says explicitly that Adam and Eve were made in the image of God's body. Well, God doesn't have a body. Uh, The Bible doesn't present God as having a body. I have a debate on that very issue Uh, Maybe I can throw a link to that in the description. Um, He he doesn't have a body, but here it's mentioned that they were created in the image of um, God's body. So an an interesting, another interesting diversion from the biblical text for you who are reading through these things and comparing and contrasting. And it also says uh, here, repeating Genesis 5-3, that um, Seth was after... Adam's own image, okay? He was he was after the image of Adam. So anyway, I thought it would be interesting to just look at the differences between the book of Moses and the book of Genesis there. And there's another place I want to do that too, all the way down at verse 51. Verse 51. It says uh, that um, God called upon our father Adam by his own voice, saying, I am God, I made the world, and men before they were in flesh. And he also said unto him, If thou if thou wilt turn unto me, and hearken unto my voice, and believe, and repent of all thy transgressions, and be baptized, even in water, in the name of mine only begotten Son, who is full of grace and truth, which is Jesus Christ, the only name which shall be given under heaven, whereby salvation shall come unto the children of men, 
you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, asking all things in his name, and whatsoever ye shall ask, it shall be given to you, or shall be given you. And our father Adam spake unto the Lord and said, Why is it that men must repent and be baptized in water? Good question. And the Lord said unto Adam, Behold, I have forgiven thee thy transgression in the garden of Eden. Hence came the saying abroad among the people that the Son of God hath atoned for original guilt, wherein the sins of the parents cannot be answered upon the heads of the children, for they are whole from the foundation of the world. All right, so uh, more distinctions to note between the book of Moses and the book of Genesis. We'll just focus on verse 52 for a while. It's a big verse, and there are a lot of differences. God says to Adam, if you turn to me, if you hear my voice, if you believe, if you repent of all your transgressions and be baptized in water in the name of Jesus, then uh, whatever you ask, it'll be given to you. So that's an important part to note. Because anytime something starts with an if, you gotta you got to ask, well, what's the, the then, right? If you do these things, and these are the things that are listed, uh, turning to God, hearkening to his voice, believing, repenting of all transgressions, and be baptizing in water, then it kind of gives a parenthetical statement about Jesus. Then, and um, then isn't, stated in the text, but that's what's implied. Then ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, asking all things in his name, not Jesus's name, but in his name, and whatsoever ye shall ask, it will be given to you. So this is very different from the Bible. If you just take this parenthetical part that is in the middle about Jesus being baptized in the name of of mine only begotten, who is full of grace and truth, which is Jesus Christ, the only name which shall be given under heaven, whereby salvation shall come unto the children of men. Uh, This type of language about Jesus Christ is not found in the Old Testament, and and for good reason, it, it just hadn't been revealed yet. So talking about the only begotten Son of God, we don't get that until the, we don't get that fully explained, I should say until the incarnation. That's where um, God was fully explained. According to John chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus has explained God or exegeted God, it could be said. But this idea of Jesus being full of grace and truth, that doesn't come until the New Testament. The name Jesus Christ, that doesn't come until the New Testament. The only name which shall be given under heaven, whereby salvation shall come, that's a loose quote of Acts 4, 12. Uh, Peter said that in Acts chapter 4. I think it was Peter. So uh, we have these New Testament themes now that are brought back and inserted into a a statement to Adam, which is very interesting. And the Old Testament doesn't approach this uh, kind of revelation that we get until after the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Now, there's all kinds of things that are said about the Son of God, leading up to the Incarnation. There's all sorts of prophecies about Jesus Christ. There are all sorts of truths given about the eternal Son of God, the Son of Man, throughout the Old Testament. But this sort of detail is not given until the New Testament. So that's a very big difference between the Pearl of Great Price, the Book of Moses, and the Torah, or the Book of Genesis. Okay, and uh, Adam asks, why is it that men must repent and be baptized in water? And uh, God says, I have forgiven, past tense, thee thy transgression in the Garden of Eden. So I I don't know, maybe I can get some feedback as to what that means. Why, it, it seems like an interesting answer. Why is it that men must repent and be baptized? Because you're already forgiven, is kind of the way I'm reading that. Um, again, baptism is not something that comes up in the Old Testament like this. You know, this is New Testament language about baptism. And uh, we don't see that in the Old Testament, especially with Adam, the, the first creature uh, made in the image of God. We don't see that kind of language spoken to him about baptism at all. Uh, and then you get in verse 54 this idea that the children do not inherit any sort of guilt from Adam. And if you look at the last video I did, the second video, where we talked about Genesis 3 and particularly Romans 5, 
you'll see uh, more specifically what the Bible has to say about that issue, because that's just another place where the Bible and uh, the Pearl of Great Price, in this case, are just so divergent, and they, they don't uh, agree. Now, one thing I want to conclude with, there's, there's one thing that I want to, uh, to finish with, and that's back in Genesis 5, down at the end, it says in verse 28, Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of a son. Now he called his name Noah, saying, This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. He named him Noah. And an alternate reading for this, if I put my magnifying glass over the one, you can look all the way to the right side and see that it says literally comfort us in. So it could read, this one will comfort us in rest from our work and from the toil of our hands. This is an interesting thing. I can't say this like for sure this is what he's thinking, but because he says that Noah is the one who will comfort us or give us rest from the ground which the Lord has cursed, it seems like He's hearkening back to Genesis chapter 3. So let me pull up Genesis 3, verse 15. God cursing the serpent. You see that here. God curses the serpent, saying, I will put enmity or animosity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. There is this promise of the woman's seed coming who was going to defeat the serpent, bruise him on the head or crush him on the head. And he's also going to be the one who will undo these other effects of the fall, the curse of the ground. You see down here, God said cursed is the ground. That's a result of the fall. The pain and suffering that comes in life now because of the fall. Well, the woman's seed is the one that everyone is going to look to to fix this. And it seems, back over here in Genesis 5.29, it seems as though Lamech was looking toward the coming one who was going to deliver them, and he thought it was going to be Noah. Now, of course, he was wrong about that because Genesis 3, the seed of the woman, that's Jesus Christ. But isn't it interesting that from the time of Genesis 3, perhaps we have evidence here with Lamech, that all people were looking forward to the coming one who was going to reverse the curse, the one who was going to save them from the effects of the fall and their own sin. Wow, pretty cool. Okay, well, I'm going to stop it there. These videos keep going longer than I want them to go, but I uh, hope this is helpful as you think through some things, uh, as you read the two different passages, and you now have some questions that you could pursue yourself. You could bring to your class. You can discuss with your other Latter-day Saints who are in your ward. I just want to generate Bible conversation uh, among you guys since you're looking at the Bible and doing what I can to help there. So you can uh, ask the types of questions like, where did Cain get his wife? And if you agree with me, you can now provide an answer to where Cain got his wife. You can talk about the differences uh, in the Pearl of Great Price and the Torah, particularly concerning baptism and the detail about Jesus Christ, and ask your teacher, why is it that the book of Moses has so much more detail about these things than the Bible does? That's a very important question that you should spend some time answering. Uh, I, I heard from a, uh, a teacher in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, someone who's leading these discussions, that you guys don't really get into deep studies on these things, but it's more of a you know, what is the Lord impressed on you? What is the Holy Ghost impressed on you as you've read these things? Well, I, I would just challenge you to study. Um, that's how we hear from God is by looking into his word and by really seeking to know what he has said. Uh, you can't really know if you're hearing from God today if you don't know if you've accurately heard what he has said in the past, which means you need to study what has been preserved for us. And, and seek to know God as he has revealed himself. That's my challenge to you. Hope you have a great day. God bless.